Welcome to Cambridge Forum with Rabbi Michael Lerner discussing his new book, The Left Hand of God, Taking Back Our Country from the Religious Right. I'm Bernard Steinberg, president of Harvard Hillel. Why do so many Americans vote against their own economic interests? How has the political right used its alliance with the religious right to achieve social dominance? Why has the political left failed to tap into Americans' deepest values? Internationally renowned theologian Rabbi Michael Lerner examines the new roles that religion and faith play in American political life in his new book, The Left Hand of God, Taking Back Our Country from the Religious Right. He argues that the right presents a self-serving and distorted vision of traditional religious values, while the left ignores the spiritual needs of the American people and shuns meaningful discussion of values. How can American leaders re-engage with citizens' spiritual values to force a meaningful vision of progressive politics? Rabbi Michael Lerner is internationally known as the editor of Tikkun Magazine, a bi-monthly Jewish critique of politics, culture, and society. He earned one PhD in philosophy from the University of California, Berkeley, and another in clinical psychology from the Wright Institute. He is rabbi of Beit Tikkun Synagogue, which meets in San Francisco and Berkeley. Welcome to Cambridge Forum, Rabbi Michael Lerner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Delighted to be here with you this evening and to um, try to um, answer some of the questions that uh, I try to do in a deeper, fuller way in the book and um, start by saying that I was involved in research on this question for the last 25 years. Started with a, um, an NIMH funded research project um, in which we began, we were interviewing thousands of middle income working people. We started around uh, issues of stress and work and family life. And out, but at the same time, we began to ask other questions that NIMH wasn't funding us to ask about why it was that um, people whose economic interests would have led them to uh, support the Democratic Party or liberal or progressive politics were moving politically to the right. And we held groups that were um, lasted for eight to ten weeks and learned about people's lives. And what we learned, and I'll sum, sum it up in one sentence, we learned there's a deep spiritual crisis in American society and that people felt that the right was speaking to that crisis and the left was not. What was that crisis? Um, well, we listened to people's lives and the, uh, the stories of their lives, and what they told us was about the psychodynamics, first of all, of the world of work, of what it was like to be them. Because for most people in, in our society, most of their waking hours are spent in the world of work and in travel to and from. So that the dynamics of the world of work, the way in which people come to perceive themselves and the world that happens in the world of work, has a monumental impact in shaping uh, how they view themselves in the world in the few hours awake that they have outside the world of work. And what was it that they were learning? They were learning day after day, week after week, month after month, that there is a bottom line in the world of work. That the bottom line is to maximize money and power for someone, usually for the owners of corporations or for the owners of the stores that they worked in, if they were uh, fortunate enough to be independent uh, uh, professionals, then they were maximizing the bottom line for maybe their, um, their group of lawyers or their group of doctors or whoever that they were in, in it. But they, uh, they very clearly got a very powerful message that the task was to maximize the bottom line. By the way, in, in some, uh, some who worked in uh, nonprofit institutions, there was also the factor of maximizing um, the ego needs of the people at the top. But, um, these, these were the uh, factors that people learned as the bottom line, and as they were learning the bottom line, they were simultaneously learning um, that every other person in the workplace had to be viewed, and every other, uh, either as a potential client, if they were not employed in the workplace, 
or as a potential ally and assistor in maximizing the bottom line, in being able to prove to your boss or to those uh, who are in power that you as an individual or your work unit or increasingly even the entire operation that you're part of, which is now part of a larger corporate structure, uh, that that is in fact going to maximize the bottom line. And if it isn't, you, you personally may be downsized, your, your work group may be downsized, uh, your whole factory, your whole workplace, your whole um, project may be uh, eliminated. So maximizing the bottom line and learning to see other people primarily in terms of can they be of use? How can I get help from this other person? How can this other person assist me in, in being able to show to those who have power in this place that I am important to them? Uh, another way of putting this in religious language, we say, is we were unlearning how to see other human beings as created in the image of God and learning how to see them from an instrumentalist point of view, what they can do for me, how they can be of use. Now, the problem that happens with people spend all day long internalizing this, uh, internalizing it in a, a language that is best summed up as looking out for number one, it was the best-selling book of the 1980s, uh, was called that, the looking out for number one. People bought it because they thought they didn't know how to do it well enough and that there were other people, obviously the people who ran their corporations or ran their workplaces, who were much better at looking out for number one than they, they needed to learn the skills, internalize how do you do that? Um, but when people spend all day thinking in those terms, they bring that home into their personal life. Now, what we learned in our research was that, um, that people firmly believe, having come home from a day like this, that that is what they call the real world, that that's the real world. Um, it's the world where they get the money to pay for their, pay for their uh, food, their, um, their children's education, their uh, mortgage, and so forth. So that's the real world. And, um, and they are absolutely certain that that cannot be changed, that that's the way the world is. It's fixed. And simultaneously, they believe um, that it's, it's um, something that runs totally counter to who they are. And so uh, very many, many people feel both um, stuck in that real world. In fact, if you tell them that it can be changed, their first in instinct is to say, that's utopian, that's fanciful, that's adolescent to believe that it can be changed. That's the real world. There's nothing we can do about it. And simultaneously, they feel dirtied by it. They feel they, um, uh, conflicted about having been part of it. Um, and both of these things are going on at the same time in most people's consciousness. So you'll pardon me that uh, in the way that I'm talking, I'm giving these sweeping generalizations that, are, uh, that come from, we did over 10,000 uh, people in groups, okay? That was my, my uh, this wasn't a small little re research project, a huge research project. We had over 10,000 people. I'm summarizing a huge amount of data and I'm talking about a tendency, not every person fits exactly in the same way in the tendencies that I'm talking about, but these are overwhelming tendencies. So people bring home from the world of work this consciousness. It, they bring it home and they then find themselves in situations in which the, they feel very alone. They don't know who they can count on. They don't know, since they have learned the rationality of the marketplace, looking out for number one, um, or another way of putting it is, be a rational maximizer of self-interest. That's what it is to be rational, as a maximizer of self-interest. Then they come home and they try to teach their children values, and the children turn on television and immediately see that the values that are trying to be taught to them by parents, by the churches or synagogues, by the mosque, by the ashrams, wherever, um, are in total, um, have no relationship to the real world. And their parents know that, that, that they're trying to teach them something that isn't, uh, that they don't actually believe could happen in the real world. And so there is this cri ethical crisis or values crisis in trying to transmit to the next generation the values you hold. Then there's a second level, and that is fam uh, that, that is friendships feel much thinner to people today because as the market consciousness has seeped into increasing numbers of people, um, the family, uh, friendship relationships become more and more 
um, a kind of exchange in which I give to you on the reasonable expectation you'll give back an equal amount of time, energy um, um, to me. And the problem with that, you might say, what's wrong with that? That's just how it is in the marketplace, right? Of course, an equal exchange. The problem is that as people get older or as they get sicker, um, they are not reasonably able to um, be part of that exchange. They can't really be counted on to give you back an equal amount of, of energy, time, and comfort, support, whatever. So many, many people in this society report that they feel, particularly as they get older and particularly as they get sicker, that the friendships weren't, are no longer um, what they used to be because there used to be an element of solidarity. And solidarity meant you were with the other person and there for the other person regardless regardless of whether you could get a good exchange on your, uh, on your time and energy, whether you could count on getting an equal amount back. You were there for the other person because you cared about the other person and you were not a uh, rational maximizer of self-interest. So as a result, people report, now you can say, oh, well, there's a certain element of nostalgia here, perhaps fan fantasy about what friendships used to be. Nevertheless, this is how people experience it, that friendships are less thick, less, uh, less solid, less countable on. And then in, uh, in relationships and family life, increasingly, we get in loving relationships a kind of um, a market relationship, a sense that uh, each person looking around for uh, in a dating world is looking around in a kind of market consciousness, as though they were in a supermarket tasting one product and then another product and then another product and then another product and discarding this one, discarding that one, discarding that one. Not necessarily because there's anything wrong with them, but because there are so many other things to taste. So, um, and um, that is seeing other people primarily from the standpoint of, again, of what good experience can I get from this one? What good experience can I get from that one? Um, eventually, people do settle down and um, many, many make commitments, whether that's in three or four years of dating or 20 or 30 years of dating, but eventually people do make commitments. And when they do, having internalized the logic of the marketplace, what they've learned all day, what is reinforced in the common sense of the society, um, they uh, have in their minds a certain level of um, calculation, let's say, um, a certain way in which um, they look for other people through the framework of, what can you do for me? Can you, how much can you satisfy my needs? And commitments increasingly, um, again, I'm talking about a tendency, not an absolute, right? Increasingly, um, uh, relationships have, uh, um, commitments have um, an element or a very often a very strong element of, I'm gonna make a commitment to you because amongst the people who are likely to fall for me in the short run, you'll satisfy more of my needs than anybody else I can meet. Um, so, there's nothing, uh, so when people, so what's the problem with this? The problem with this is that everybody intuitively knows this and everybody knows that they're, if they have any respect for their partner, that their partner has probably been somebody who has gotten what it is to be rational in the society. And, and as a maximizer of self-interest, they've internalized this consciousness. And so to the extent that they've internalized the consciousness, um, then everyone feels insecure in their relationships, including uh, now I'm talking not only of the 50% of marriages that end in divorce, but also in the 50% of marriages that don't end in divorce, because people are never sure that their partner can't at some point cut a better deal. And if they can cut a better deal, it seems fundamentally irrational to them not to do so. How could they not do that if they're rational maximizers of self-interest? So please don't misunderstand me here. First of all, um, the, the degree of insecurity that people feel is not the same for everyone. And so how alone people feel depends on many other factors, um, some of which have to do with the individual and their psychic makeup and so forth, but some which have to do with um, what they perceive to be objective factors. I'm not saying they are objective, but what people perceive to be objective factors, namely their own perception of their own marketability on the marketplace of relationships. Because the younger you are, the more conventionally attractive you are, or the wealthier you are, the less this seems terrifying to you. 
The older you are, the less conventionally attractive you are, the less financially secure you are, the more terrifying it is to you. So when people talk about the great insecurity in families, it's somewhat affected by their own perception of their marketability. You see what I'm talking about here? You get what I'm saying? Yeah, so this is, um, this is um, a, but nevertheless, for huge numbers of people, including, as I say, not just the ones whose families will end up in divorce, but the 50% that won't end up in divorce, there's tremendous insecurity and fear that this could happen, that you're never sure that it won't happen, uh, and increasingly, um, people feel that it's happening all around them, and it may well happen to them, and that they may be thrown into uh, chaos in their own personal lives in ways that they don't know how they can fully handle. Now. I am not trying to blame anyone here. I am not trying to put anybody down or critique anybody. I think it's almost impossible to grow up in this society without having internalized this kind of consciousness and certainly to live in this society, to work in this society, to become successful in this society in any way, to not have uh, strong elements of this in one's mind. But I say almost because there is another way to think about the world and it's a way that um, we call spiritual. And spiritual is, uh, a spiritual way of thinking is that you look at, at other human beings and you see this, them as embodiments of the sacred, as holy beings, as fundamentally valuable for who they are and not for what they can do for you, not for what they can deliver, not for how, how successful they will be, not for how good a cook they are, not for how good a parent they will be, not for how good an, uh, uh, of, um, a, an earner they will be, not, not for how great, how much status they will have in the world, but you see them in and of themselves as being beautiful embodiments of the holy. That's a spiritual way of understanding uh, human beings and the spiritual way of understanding the larger physical world also is relevant here because for many, many people, um, when they go out to nature, there is having, to the extent that they've internalized that consciousness, they look around and see the world from the standpoint of, gee, I wonder if there's anything here I can sell, turn into a, maybe I could turn something here into a commodity and make a buck off of this. Um, um, so a spiritual consciousness is looking at the world through the standpoint of awe and wonder at the ra and radical amazement at the grandeur of creation. This is a very different consciousness, okay? This is a very different way of thinking about the world. And, and what we learned in our research is that a huge number of people in this society, middle income working people, hunger for that spiritual way of being, hunger for that spiritual consciousness, and feel that their lives are um, less together and less valuable because they can't find it, because they are so much stuck in a world of manipulation, of utilitarian calculation, um, and in, and in a work world in which they can't see how what they're doing contributes to any higher good than making money for somebody, usually not themselves, but a little bit for themselves also. And so, don't get me wrong, it's not that I'm saying to people that people don't care at all about the money. They do care about the money, but very large numbers of people care also about the fact that they want some framework of meaning and purpose for their lives that transcends the materialism and selfishness of the competitive marketplace. And they cannot find it in the larger society. Now here comes the political right, and particularly the religious right, and he steps in and says, well, there's a spiritual crisis in this society. And they're correct. And they say, and that crisis is based on materialism and selfishness. And they are correct. And then they, unfortunately, turn and say, and you know where this comes from? It comes from the special interests who are introducing um, materialism and selfishness into our society. And who are those special interests? Well, it depends on what country you're talking about, because whoever is the demeaned other of whatever country the religious right is functioning in, that's who the special interest is. So, for example, in Europe, the special interests were the Jews. 
In the United States, for a long time, the special interests were uh, African Americans and Native Americans. But increasingly, in the last 20 years in this country, the special interest, uh, the primary demeaned other, has now, they've sort of made room for more, and uh, primarily gays and lesbians, and, and feminists, that is, women who have been asking to, uh, to uh, create a society that repairs the tremendous uh, inequalities that existed before, or gays and lesbians who've asked that, or African Americans who've asked that, and because they're asking to repair the damage that was done to them historically, um, they're called special interests who are introducing selfishness and materialism. Now the irony of this is that the right, while acknowledging the spiritual crisis is simultaneously the primary force in the society that champions the ethos of materialism and selfishness in the world of work. Because in the world of work, in the corporations, the political right has been the primary force insisting that there be no introduction of categories of social responsibility. Whenever people come either through government or through, in, uh, through voluntary organizations like the unions and say, treat your workers right, pay them enough money so that they can live, um, have he safety and health regulations in your workplace, um, provide for, um, provide, uh, stop polluting the environment, um, watch out for what the consequences for what you're producing. The right is the force that has systematically opposed every such attempt to bring other values into the workplace besides the values of m maximizing their own money and power. So how do they get away with this? Mac on the one hand, the champion of selfishness and materialism in the world of work and in the economy, and on the other hand, the champion of the pain that people feel when they bring that home into personal life. How do they get away with this? Well, the answer is they get away with it because the liberal and progressive forces aren't even in the relevant ballpark and don't have a clue about the spiritual crisis, and hence have allowed the right to become the only articulator of the spiritual crisis. And you see, people tremendously appreciate when they've been suffering, and um, particularly suffering from a source they don't fully understand, that somebody comes forward and names what they're suffering from. And so, just as the women's movement earned tremendous credibility when it was able to help women understand that it wasn't that they were personally screwed up, that there was a screwed up social reality of sexism and patriarchy, so similarly today, the right is able to do this in regard to the spiritual crisis in American society, to help people understand that it's not them that screwed up, that there's a social reality that screwed up, that they're, in fact, they are surrounded by a materialism and selfishness that really does hurt them and really does undermine loving connections and really does make them have good reason to be scared about their loving relationships. But the left, because it has had a long history of fighting against the religion and spirituality as being associated with feudalism, which is where the left emerged from in its struggle uh, 300 years ago, has never developed the categories, the intellectual categories, to understand the spiritual needs of people. Instead, the left focuses entirely on, um, or almost entirely on, I'm not gonna, let's qualify it, almost entirely on, um, inclusion. That is to say, it looks at the society and says, there are some groups who have been uh, refused equal access to the material well-being of our society or to the political rights of our society, and we want to fight to bring them in so that they can share equally in the material well-being and in the political well-being that the rest of us have. Now, I've been part of the left for the last 40 years, and I am proud of that battle, and I'm totally in solidarity with the left for those battles of inclusion. I think they are extremely important. Only, we're not winning. And we're not winning in part because for a very large section of our population, the issue isn't only their material needs or their rights. For a very large section of the population, they are equally in pain uh, with regard to the deprivation of their hunger for meaning and purpose, the deprivation of their, of their spiritual needs, for the deprivation of a society that can be based on love and caring and generosity and kindness. And that is as fundamental to their need structure but the left doesn't have a category to capture that. So as a result, when the left hears words like religion or spirituality, immediately they run into, they either say, oh, spirituality, that's new age mush, or they, they say, 
um, oh, those are simply code words for the racism, sexism, and homophobia of the right. That is, they, they are correct that the, the right has manipulated some of that spiritual need and some of the religious needs in a racist, sexist, or homophobic direction. But they, are, but they miss that there is a real crisis that's being manipulated. Do you see what I'm saying? They, they miss that there is a reality here, even though the, the, the right solution to the reality is destructive, there is something really that the right is addressing. It's a real set of needs. And, uh, and if we want to change this society, we have to build a, a way of addressing those needs. That's what led us in Tikkun magazine to begin to, 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 to well, first of all, to create Tikkun out of that research and then to try to uh, talk to people about this and eventually to create the Tikkun community's network of spiritual progressives, which we have just started creating in the past year, to try to build a, an alternative to the political right and to the religious right, to try to talk in a spiritual discourse and to talk about the fundamental, uh, a progressive spirituality that could be an alternative to reactionary forms of spirituality. Now, what does that mean? Um, well, that's what the book is about, okay? That, so, uh, I'm not going to be able to fully summarize the left hand of God taking back our country from the religious right in, a, in the few minutes left, but, I do, um, but we'll have questions and answers. Um, I do want to say here's the fundamental. A, um, the fundamental core idea of a progressive spirituality is this, that we need a new bottom line in America and in fact in all of the West. We need a new bottom line. We need a new definition of productivity, efficiency, and rationality so that institutions, corporations, social practices are not judged efficient, rational, and productive only to the extent that they maximize money and power, but also to the extent that they maximize love and caring, kindness and generosity, ethical and ecological sensitivity, enhance our capacities to respond to other human beings as embodiments of the sacred, and enhance our capacities to respond to the universe with awe and wonder and radical amazement at the grandeur of all that is. This is a very different way. This is a very different conception of rationality, but you have to, if you think, well, wait a second, they didn't teach me that in economics. Um, right, but what, where did they get their definition of productivity, efficiency, and rationality? They simply assumed it. They, they simply assumed it. There were no economic tests that proved that rationality was maximizing money or power. That was their belief system that they assumed as their fundamental, as their religion. It was part of the dominant religion of the society, which is not Christianity, but is a certain vision of, uh, of that what counts is that which can be measured, that the only thing that's real is that which can be measured and subject to empirical verification. But as I'm sure any of you who've taken a um, philosophy course know, um, the notion that that which is real um, is that which, or that which can be known, is that which can be verified through our empirical senses or measured, is a notion which itself cannot be uh, empirically verified or measured. Do you understand what I'm saying here? That the, that the fundamental belief system of the contemporary world, that that which is real is that which can be measured or that which can be subject to empirical verification, is a belief system that has no stronger foundation than any other of the belief systems. It's, I'm not against the belief system, I'm just saying I welcome all people's religions, including the dominant one of this society, but most people don't get that they're in a religious system, they think it's just truth. But that's what it is to be in a religious system, is to, <laughs> is to believe that it's just truth without any argument, you know, without any foundation for it, except that it seems like right to me. Okay, so, um, uh, so now what I want to say is, this, if you try the new bottom line, you will quickly see that most of our institutions, social practices, and corporations are irrational, inefficient, unproductive. They don't tend to maximize uh, um, people's capacity to be loving and caring, or kind and gentle or generous, or ethically or ecologically sensitive, or, um, or able to see other human beings in a, in a, uh, as embodiments of the sacred, or able to respond to the universe with awe and wonder. So they are fundamentally, by this criterion, irrational, inefficient, and unproductive. I don't mean to say that there aren't a lot of very 
wonderful, loving, caring, kind, ethically and ecologically sensitive human beings. But most people are that despite the institutions in which they spend all their day. They are that despite it. And in fact, if you speak to people about this, they will tell you that it takes tremendous amount of courage to continue to hold on to their uh, their connection with kindness and generosity and so forth when they're surrounded by a world that seems to uh, negate that and make them feel like a bit like fools for holding on to those kinds of values when the real world doesn't validate that. So another way of putting what we're talking about with a new bottom line in a spiritual politics is we want to reconstruct the institutions of our society in such a way that our interests, namely those that are rewarded by the institutions, are not in conflict, no longer in conflict with our values. See what I'm talking about here? That we can build a society that is, um, that is not a struggle between what we really believe in and what we're doing all day. But most people are in that struggle. So now what does this turn out to be in concrete terms? How do you go about doing that? Well, partly I have to say that uh, this is like um, the, uh, our movement to have a new bottom line, to have a spiritual politics. We're in the same position as the women's movement was in the, in the 1960s when they started to talk about patriarchy. First of all, we're in the position in which people would said to the women at that point, show us a society that's based on this. Show us something realistic. And of course they couldn't, you know, have you, sh um, show us some, uh, hasn't it always been this way for the last 10,000 years? Yeah, it had been. Um, well, then you're being very unrealistic to think it can change, right? Well, thank God the women were unrealistic. And as a result of that, there was, there was changes that were, took place that were way beyond even the most visionary of the, of the women in the second, second um, uh, uh, wave of feminism. Um, even um, the, what actually happened was so far beyond what people envisioned in the, in the early, in the mid 60s about what was possible. Um, that is, it's, uh, it's a big mistake to let realism shape your view. Um, we, in the, uh, in the Jewish renewal movement as a rabbi, I say realism is idolatry. Idolatry, it, by that I mean that realism is allowing that which is to determine or shape for you that which can be. Whereas believing in God is believing in the possibility of possibility. It is believing that there is a force in the universe that makes possible the transformation from that which is to that which could and should be. And that's why, by the way, I say that many religious people aren't. They don't believe in God. They don't really believe in God. They don't believe that much can change. They end up being compromised with the existing world because they think that's realism and they have to do that. And many people who think they don't believe in God really do. That is, they really, are, they really do hold to the vision of the possibility of transformation and healing of the world. And that's, in my view, is what it means to believe in God, to believe whatever language you use to articulate that. Um, so I see many religious people as Hellenists in drag. That is, they, um, uh, they actually believe that the world is fixed and not much can be changed and uh, they accommodate to that, but then they do their little, they go daven in the morning or they go, they go to church or the synagogue or whatever and they do their little side thing here of religion. Um, so what would this, so the second thing about what feminism did was when it, it also had the situation of well, how do you play this out? How does, what would a, a non-patriarchal world look like? What would it look like to have women's equ equality? And for a, a significant period of time, women didn't know the answer. What they did was they sat with each other and they began to allow themselves to envision this different kind of world. And that's what we need to do in, in building a spiritual politics. We need to have people come together in their workplaces and in other institutions in which they are connected and envision what would it look like if this institution had a new bottom line of love and caring and generosity and kindness, et cetera, ecological sensitivity and so forth. What would this institution look like? And the only rule is let there be no reality police in that discussion. The reality police are the voices in your head that are saying it'll never happen, it can't happen, so there's no point in even thinking this way. And so if you get rid of the reality police and then allow yourself to have this conversation, um, we will build the kind of movement that can be transformative. Now, um, in the book, I try to lay out many, many particulars of how 
it could look, but that's just my view, that's just my particular perception. We are building a network of spiritual progressives, and by the way, you can find out more information by looking at our website, www.spiritualprogressives.org, spiritualprogressives.org, um, to find out more, more of that, but you'll find a lot of the details in the book. But that book is one perception, and the movement that we're talking about can't simply be uh, Rabbi Michael Lerner's movement. It's a, we're talking about something much, much broader and not um, in which we will argue out and think out how to take these ideas forward. But let me just suggest one, one of them to you, which I sure will uh, appeal to some and be offensive to others. It's only one way of me, me attempting to say, well, how would you go forward with this? Well, I've done that in relationship to one set of institutions, namely corporations. And what, we're, uh, what we've put forward in the network of spiritual progressives is the notion of a social responsibility amendment to the federal constitution, the SRA. Probably will never pass, but uh, the ERA never passed either. And nevertheless, it had a tremendous impact in changing the discourse and understanding of tens of millions of people in this country. The struggle for it had a tremendous impact in this, in this country. The SRA says the following, that every corporation with an income of more than $50 million a year, so we're not talking about mom and pop operations here, every corporation with an income of more than $50 million a year must get a new corporate charter once every 10 years. And that new corporate charter will only be granted to those corporations which can prove a satisfactory history of social responsibility to a jury of ordinary citizens. We're not going to create some government regulatory body because we know that the regulatory bodies, the people who are, uh, who are regulating, often end up in bed with those whom they're, whom they're supposedly regulating. So we want to trust ordinary citizens just as we trust them to make decisions of life and death over the life of individuals. They can make life and death decisions over the future of corporations if the corporations cannot satisfactorily convince them that they have an adequate um, history of social responsibility. Um, that, by the way, is not an anti-corporate anti measure. It's on the contrary. There are, um, I want to make it clear that from our perspective, there are millions of very decent, morally oriented people in corporations. They would love to have a new bottom line. They would love to, to have um, a way to be more ethically and ecologically sensitive, to be more kind and generous in what they're doing. Only they, uh, they will tell you from the very top on, uh, down, down, they have a fiduciary responsibility to their investors to maximize their investment. And that they, they in fact would get tossed out, possibly even sued, if they didn't uh, make decisions based on how to maximize their investments. So they are caught in a system. It's not that they are evil people running most of our corporations. It's not true. There are very many, many decent people there. But they're caught in a system. The, the social responsibility amendment will come to help them because they will then be able to turn to their corporate boards or to their investors and say, hey, I had no choice but to be more ecologically sensitive. I had no choice but to make our corporations more uh, uh, generous and kind and uh, uh, trying to promote different kinds of values here because otherwise we're going to lose our corporate charter. So I was being worrying about your fiduciary responsibility and that will free people who really want to do good to be able to do good. This is a, general, this is a specific of the general point that I'm making of create situations in which people's interests ally with their values rather than have to be in conflict with them. Well, this is only a beginning and there are many, many other things I can talk about perhaps in the question and answer period, but they're laid out in considerable detail in the book Left Hand of God. Um, so what I want to say is that there's a general feeling, however, when you get to um, hear this, in which people, people respond with, yeah, this is great, but it'll never happen. In fact, I, I got this. I, um, I, some of you may have heard this because I, I was so impressed with this first experience that I had of talking about this to a group of, um, of uh, Methodists in Kansas. And 400 Methodists, and, they ch and afterward, they were so excited about these ideas. And then they came up to me afterwards and said, but it'll never work. So I said, well, why will it never work? They said, well, you see, um, the only people who will like these ideas are Methodists in Kansas. So, so I said, well, why do you think that? They said, 
because we're, we're smart people. We watch television, we, watch, we read newspapers, we read magazines. We know that the people on the coast are narcissistic materialists, that all they care about is themselves and as much money as possible. We know what those lawyers in Boston are doing. We watch the television show. We see the, com the shared assumptions of what people have. They're all out for themselves all the time. It's impossible to ever expect to change that. Now, on the other hand, when I talk about this in Boston or in New York or in Washington or in Seattle or San Francisco or Los Angeles, people say to me, yeah, this is terrific, but middle America, they'll never buy this. <laughs> and this is the thing that keeps us. You see, all of us believe that we would love to live in this kind of a world and we're certain that it's only our friends or the members of our church or synagogue or our particular group or our particular union or our particular political movement. They're the only ones who really have any kind of idealism and everybody else is stuck. So everybody is feeling this about everyone else and because everybody feels this about everybody else, everybody continues to act in the same old way, namely the way that to be a rational maximizer of self-interest because they feel that there is no alternative. There's nothing that they can do given that everybody else is that way. In other words, they don't know about you and you don't know about them. The media keeps all of us invisible to each other and so the fact that there are tens of millions of people in this country who desperately want a different reality reality is never visible because all of us decide instead to be realistic and to compromise with the reality that we hate. Now I'm here to ask you to not do that anymore, to come out of the closet as spiritual people. And by that spiritual people, I'm not telling you you should become religious. I'm not telling you you should, if you are religious, terrific. If you're not religious, but you have a spiritual consciousness, you know that there is something in the universe or you understand that people have these spiritual needs, that there's something in the universe about love and caring and generosity that isn't merely a whim like uh, chocolate ice cream or versus strawberry ice cream, that there's something fundamental about reality that needs that love and kindness and generosity. Come out of the closet as spiritual people and say to the people who are asking you for money for support for this, that or the other project, yeah, it's good, but it doesn't go deep enough. Uh, we need to transform the left in that way so that it can be a deeper articulator of this vision um, if that is possible. I'm not guaranteeing that it's possible. But, um, but we definitely need, the only way we're actually going to be able to change this country fundamentally is for you to go for your highest vision. That can happen. The network of spiritual progressives is one of the directions to come. I invite you to join us, to become part of it. Let's change it together. Thank you. Thank you. You're joining us at Cambridge Forum, listening to Rabbi Michael Lerner discussing the left hand of God. Um, I'd like to begin the, uh, the Q&A with a, a somewhat uh, technical, philosophic question to you. You're, you're trained in philosophy. Um, why schlep God into it? Um, I, I'm just, I'm, they're, they're, why, why, why put God at the center of this argument? Why, why talk about the left hand of God or the right hand of God? Um, and I'm saying that from two perspectives. Uh, one perspective is that the alternative to rational instrumentality, seeing people as objects, I, I, I resonated very deeply uh, with, your, with your social critique. But the alternative to that is not only what you said, but within secular thought, in fact, central se secular thought, secular humanism, we have a response to that. I mean, Kant himself talked about humans beings not being seen as instruments, but as ends in themselves, etc. And met, there are many other secular alternatives to what you're saying, so why bring God into this? That's on the one side of, of uh, why bring God into it. The other side of why bring God into it sort of reminds me of the, the, the Joan Baez song that I, I know you know because you're a child of the 60s as I am, and we, we know Joan Baez by heart, um, with God on our side. And, and this reads a little bit, meaning the, the, the book and also the, my read of your discourse, 
um, that um, you know, we talk about awe, we talk about we love, but actually the discourse doesn't sound very full of awe in the sense that you seem to be using a discourse that sounds almost as if you know what God wants, uh, we've got God in our hand, uh, and that's a little bit problematic you know, from the perspective of what, of what awe is really about. And in terms of what love's about, I mean, you know, what does this mean, take back from the, take, bring our country back? I mean, that kind of competitive, let's make God, well, what, an instrument? Are we making God an object of our politics? And of course, we don't want to make human beings objects, right? So those are the kind of um, questions that, that uh, were provoked by your very, very moving, passionate uh, talk. Thank you. Um, well, you're, you're raising questions that aren't short, short answer questions. Uh, so um, this is another set of themes that I deal with in the book. Um, to start, I want to say that m throughout human history, there has been a struggle between two worldviews. And um, the one worldview sees human beings as thrown into this world uh, alone in struggle with others. And uh, the world is fundamentally made up of people who are looking out for number one, taking care of themselves, and will do whatever they need to do to maximize their own self-interest. Because of that, the world is a very scary place. And um, our general task for survival is to figure out how we can get um, some, some way of defending ourselves from these predatory others um, who each really have as their highest goal to achieve power for themselves. And so that view I call the power overview or um, the fear view of the nature of reality. Um, and uh, then on the other hand, there is a view of reality that says, no, human beings were not thrown into the world alone. I mean, that thrownness, for those of you who know Heidegger, this is one of his concepts, um, that uh, we're, we're not thrown, in, uh, thrown into the world by ourselves, that actually we come into the world with, um, and only could survive because of a mothering other, and that our fundamental reality from the start is of connection to another. And although some of us might have uh, questions about how good mothering we got or whatever, um, you know, that's not, uh, the, the, the fundamental point is that you wouldn't have survived without that mothering other who was taking care of you at a point when it wasn't in her, her or his interest to do so. Um, so, um, and from that worldview, from that experience comes uh, a worldview that says it's possible to um, to see the world from the standpoint of the possibility of love and caring and generosity. Now, most of us are someplace uh, um, on a um, continuum between these two voices. Both voices are in our head almost all the time. The voice of fear and the voice of hope. The voice of power over and domination as reality, the voice of love and kindness as reality. And where we are on this uh, continuum is affected in part by our childhood experiences, in part by our adult life experiences, in part by the ideologies or religious systems we buy into, and in part by our assessment of where the social energy is going. That is, where is everybody else going? Because when we are in a particular historical moment where the energies are moving towards fear, it, um, most people find it much more, uh, the, the voices inside their head that told them that it's a fearful reality seem to be validated more by the world, by the real world going on around them. And so those parts of their consciousness and those parts of the stories they've heard that reinforce fear get re dramatically reinforced. Whereas conversely, at those moments, for example, in the 1930s or the 1960s and our 70s, when energy seemed to be moving towards hope, then the voices inside of our heads that tell us about this, um, about the possibility of a world of kindness and generosity and love seem less crazy. In fact, um, you can trace uh, in cultural history um, the, um, at, at key moments in our culture where the energies are moving towards fear, the people who are the most cynical about the possibilities of change are seen as 
deep, profound uh, thinkers, the writers who emphasize cynicism are th thought of as brilliant writers, the poets as brilliant poets, the songwriters as brilliant songwriters, the, um, the philosophers as brilliant philosophers. When the energy is moving more towards hope, then a different set of philosophers and poets and writers seem to be uh, d uh, perceived as deep and profound and so forth. Depending on where the social energy is, um, the voices begin to resonate more where do you talk, see what I'm getting at now? Now, we, we are all someplace in this, and the Bible and every other religious tradition is a product of human beings. That is to say, uh, though however divinely inspired, however much God revealed herself or himself through, that, uh, through um, ordinary human beings, the human beings who received God's testimony received it through their own limited capacities. Okay, they received it as human beings could receive it, and you will find in the Bible, both and in every other religious and spiritual tradition, both sets of voices. You will hear, you, you can find in sometimes in the same sentence, one half of the sentence seeming to reflect the voice of hope, and, some, and the other half reflecting the voice of fear. Um, and both voices are there because they're there in every human being. So, um, when I talk about the right hand of God, I talk about that part of the way in which people perceive God's voice as coming through the frame of fear and power and power over domination. And when I talk about the left hand of God, I'm talking about when people are more open to hearing the voices that they hear from of God or the ways in which they intuit the spiritual reality of the universe through the perception of the possibility of love and caring. And uh, all of the religious texts and all religious movements have both kinds of voices within them. The right hand of God, why do I call it the right hand? Because there's this text in the, after the, um, the Egyptians um, have chased the, the Jews out um, through the Red Sea and then they drown and so forth. Miriam writes this song and says, your right hand, God, your right hand is filled with power. And so I said, okay, fine. Then the left hand is the other side of God. The, actually, the Kabbalah makes it, switches it 100% and, and does it the opposite way. So I've had this argument with various uh, people, but I've had uh, Danny Matt, who's the scholar of Kabbalah and uh, the editor of the, the recent Zohar thing, supports my pers perspective as being, uh, uh, anyway, well, I won't go there. <laughs> so, um, uh, so, but anyway, to say that, um, so these are two different ways of hearing God's voice. Now, I am not saying that, that God really is the left hand of God. I want to make two things really clear here. I am not mapping in a one-to-one -one relationship the, the left hand of God or the right hand of God, the fear and the hope, in a one-to-one -one relationship to the political right and the political left. On the contrary, I, might, I have been to many political rallies where I hear the fearful uh, element being put forward by anti-war people in which they don't uh, go for uh, a vision of hope, they go for a vision of fear. And so they are, in my view, um, moving, uh, using the, the voice of the right hand of God very much more. Now then, then you might say, but why are you calling that the voice of God at all? Because actually, historically, in the religious traditions, that right hand of God played a very important role. Because at moments when people were beaten down and, and um, powerless, they, and could not envision how anything they could do would change reality, then they envisioned God as powerful and as empowering to make it possible to change a seemingly impossible reality. And so they looked at God with that right hand of God consciousness, and they championed in that and said, and that played a very empowering role at some historical moments. However, the bizarre thing and distorting thing of the current historical moment is that instead of this being the powerless who, who cling on to the right hand of God as a way of hoping to, to overcome that reality, we have the, elite, the richest elites of the richest country in the world and the most powerful country in the world, uh, the most militaristic country in the world, using the voice of the right hand of God to justify policies that are exactly the opposite of how the Bible used that, because the Bible used that to support the poor and these people are using it to screw the poor. So that's why I'm talking about God in this way. <laughs>
You're listening to Rabbi Michael Lerner talking about the left hand of God and the right hand of God. Um, let's take some questions question. from the audience. Uh, please yeah. line up at the microphone. Uh, be succinct. I have uh, there a are many people here yeah. uh, who want to have an opportunity to ask a question. Uh, George um, Bush is yeah. a very spiritual man. Why doesn't he get this consciousness of ways of awe and amazement and what you're talking about? He is a spiritual man. Because there are both voices in our heads. Because they're both there. Because the voice of fear and the voice, voice of hope are both there. And which triumph at any given moment, as I say, is a complex reality. Of, but uh, I would say that for, um, one of the things that I do in my book is try to show that the triumph of the religious right and of the political right in the 1980s and subsequently was in part a product of the loss of hope on the part of the political left in the 1970s. That is, there's a dialectical relationship here between what actually happened in the rise of the right and what had happened inside the left. And I try to tell that story in, in some detail in the book because the right didn't, you know, sometimes people say, oh, you know, this is a right-wing period. Uh, what in the world are they talking about? Periods don't descend from heaven as though they suddenly were in a right-wing period. If we were in a progressive period and then we failed to, con to win enough hearts to stay progressive, we screwed up. We did something, we made a mistake. I've never heard an on, a serious, honest discussion in the liberal and progressive forces about what that was. Well, in the left hand of God, you will see an analysis. You might not agree with all of the analysis, but I can, I, I'll tell you this, if you read the book, you'll be sure, I, I'm positive I'll convince you of this, that we need an analysis, that we need to have an answer to what was it that we didn't do when we had the attention of this country, what was, how was it that we failed to sustain them, sustain that, uh, that, that attention? And please don't tell me it's about not having enough money because we didn't have any money when we were the anti-war movement or the women's movement or the civil rights movement. And it wasn't, it, it was, there, where, there was a moment, a significant moment in which we lost our own faith in ourselves and a faith in our beliefs. And now how that happened and how that then transferred into social energy moving to the right, that's part of the story I tell. I'm not going to try it all tonight. Thank you. Good evening. Um, He's a child of the 60s. I just want to mention that God on Our Side is a Bob Dylan song. Um, <laughs> sung beautifully by Joan Baez. <laughs> um, sung beautifully by Bob. Bob Zimmerman, Bob Zimmerman. you're talking about. Um, <laughs> I, I agree with um, a lot of what you say. One thing that I'm concerned about is, is what it means for the, political, for, for the voting in the political arena. And specifically, I think, um, uh, I think that Adam Smith and Locke might have been very progressive people Mm -hmm. who modeled a way in which they said we negotiate in the public arena whatever we do outside it. And my view of the biggest problem in this country is that that arena has been bought out by money. So I think, um, wh however much I agree with your values and everything you said, my biggest thing would be to have something, and maybe it would be easier, maybe not e as, as easy as, as your amendment or proposal is, to make public financing of all elections. Because I think that in fact, rationalization mm -hmm. as it affects actual marketplace transactions is a very rational way to do it. But the problem is that when money buys out the marketplace, and so the values that govern and regulate mm -hmm. the marketplace become bought up by money, that's the problem. I certainly agree with you that, and I s totally support any re such reforms that could happen. Um, nothing in what I say should be seen as undercutting any of the struggles that people are currently involved in in every arena to try to transform this society. I'm only trying to explain why you're not winning, okay? It's not that I think that these other things, I mean, somebody can get up next and say, but what about, don't you think that uh, it's critical to have universal health care? Of course I do. In fact, that's one of the, po the points of the spiritual covenant with America that I lay out in, the, uh, in this book. But the issue isn't what's right. The issue is how do you speak in a deep enough level to build the kind of a movement that could actually win and transform this country. And that's the problem. So if I could win electoral, uh, electoral reform and get money out of politics, I'm totally for it. But I, I, what I've seen is that we win some little victories, and they're good ones, important ones, but 
there are a lot, a lot moving in the wrong direction at the same time. And we have to pay attention to that and figure out uh, in a broader, a deeper kind of strategy. And what you're saying, 100%. I agree with you, 100%. Yeah. Rabbi Lerner, my name is Michael Brower. I rise to agree completely with everything you said to make one further suggestion, which maybe you consider in the book. And parenthetically, I spent a lifetime of work on the ills of our system coming from a spiritual family that was not a religious family. So I agree one can get there with or without conscious appeal to God because I was obviously raised with God even though it wasn't a church. Um, I love your diagnosis that American capitalism, the market as it is now pursued, leaves a spiritual hunger in people. I love your proposal that giant corporations should be rechartered every 10 years. And as you know, I'll tell the foreign participants who may or may not know, when corporations were born in Sweden and England and then in this country in the colonial period, they had to apply for a new charter every few years. It was not a permanent charter and they had to behave with social responsibility. So you, in a sense, are asking to go back to our roots. Absolutely. One further proposal, which I'm working on, which is even more radical. May, may we say, have a question, though? Look at Because other, other people want to talk. Have you looked at the governance of the corporations at the board of directors? They are elected only by the stockholders. Yeah. The parallel I would draw is imagine the American colonies where the United States Senate is not elected by the people, but by the legislators who are elected only by white males of a certain age with a certain wealth. Mm -hmm. That's what we do with corporations today. And then we turn around and say, oh, by the way, would you please look out for the interests of all people, all races, and the ecology sir, of the planet? Sir, we, we need a question. So have you looked and could mm -hmm. you look at the issue of how we elect the boards of directors of corporations? Well, um, it's a good question. I think that the proposal that I made, the SRA, Social Responsibility Amendment, actually would take care of that. But I think um, I'm delighted that you're an ally with me on this. I think we're thinking in the same direction. And um, the, social, the amendment to the Constitution, if you're going to go for it, see, one of the things I've learned in, in struggles is that we spend so much energy fighting for small things, and the, and the corporations throw all of their energy to defeating um, and, and often succeed in defeating us when we're asking for only a small change. Might as well ask for a big change. Okay, they're not, they, they throw all of their energy up for the smaller changes and we're so unvisionary in what we ask for. Let's ask for, let's put on an agenda, a vision of a different kind of society that we're for and yes, they'll defeat us also. But while we're in that struggle, we'll be convincing a hell of a lot more people about a larger vision of change than we do when each of us is in our particular sphere fighting for one little part of the reform that we really want. One other thing I want to say here is that for those of you who are leaving um, before the, um, uh, all the men in the line, gee, uh, I had the sort of feeling about that too. With some ladies of, stuff for um, Of the fact that um, I was talking about love. What did I do wrong? No, <laughs> no women are getting up to talk about. Um, anyway, that, that before you leave, you can come over and get a, a book. Um, I know it's placed in a funny place that makes it hard for you to feel somewhat embarrassed to disrupt by going up there, but we can sell books before we're finished with the discussion if you have to leave. Yeah, go ahead. Um, continuing the corporate discussion, I also love your charter idea. Um, what about the aspect of how corporations are legally bound to their quarterly earnings at the moment? Do we have to reform the stock market too? Um, I think that this amendment to the Constitution would change the stock market and um, it, uh, many, I mean, it would require that a whole bunch of laws would be changed in accord with, that's why I'm going for an amendment to the Constitution. Also, the other reason for an amendment to the Constitution, even though it's much harder to achieve, is that it deals with the issue of a capital flight because um, if you're, uh, you, you, often when one state starts to implement uh, a change, then the co corporations threaten that they'll move to another state. So, but yes, you're right. We would have to have many laws changed as well. Go, sir. Sir, you're on. I wanted to see how much time I had to ask a question. Uh, I'm watching this man right over here. 
You're fine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I practice Buddhism, uh, and my name is Marty Levin, by the way. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. And um, I was in the anti-war movement for a short time, you know, in the 70s, and I saw there was a great spiritual gap in the movement. I was very aware of it. I was, you know, of the hippie generation where we, we shared a lot of uh, bonds of love, and uh, we did have a great vision of, you know, connecting uh, with people on a heart-to-heart -heart basis. But I never spoke up, and then recently I've been going again to some anti-war uh, activities, and I've been speaking up and saying, um, it really uh, starts with um, the individual. We have to become peaceful. We have to develop wisdom. And I happen to chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo to do that myself. There's many ways of achieving this. But I felt like I was speaking in a vacuum. And I felt very self-conscious every time I spoke up. But I knew that it was so important to say this. So I'm so glad you're, you're, you're bringing this to the fore. My question is, um, how can we really make this part of the mainstream as opposed to uh, like what I felt, which I was speaking in this vacuum? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that would well, be my question. There's, that's why we need organization. We need a, a network of people. You can't just do it by yourself. Um, when you try to bring this into um, many progressive movements, people think you're, um, as I say, a, a new age flake or whatever. You have to, so that's why we're organizing, we're building, and we have a chapter here in, in um, Boston of the Tikkun community, which is the sponsor of the Network of Spiritual Progressives. And I hope uh, there's some way, I think, at the back to sign up for that. Is there? Is there something to sign up on? Is there? In the front there? Okay, so um, I hope people will sign up for it. And oh, also when we have uh, brochures like these, you can join the Tikkun community and when you join, you automatically become a member of the Network of Spiritual Progressives. There's some there and I have more, uh, more here. And we're having a national conference in May, May 17th to 20th in Washington, D.C., of the Network of Spiritual Progressives. And uh, it, we just had one on the West Coast where we had 1,400 people and uh, we had to turn away hundreds more. There are, you're not alone. There are a lot of people who want this, a real, real lot of people who want this. But you can't do it by yourself. Uh, and uh, you, need, you need to be in network with others and you need to be in groups with other people. And together, then you can raise these issues in a more sustained way. I also want to say that one of, I mean, one of the things when you're talking, and I, 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 I gave a very, just a little chunk of what I'm talking about in this book, because another level is, yeah, we need to transform what our own movements feel like. Um, one of the things that I experienced when I go to, um, uh, when I, before I was a rabbi, um, I used to go to different synagogues. And when I would go to a reform or conservative or a reconstructionist or Jewish renewal synagogue, I always knew, well, I'll leave Jewish renewal out, it doesn't fit exactly into this, into this paradigm, but I always knew in the, in the reform, and, uh, reform and reconstructionist and conservative synagogues, I'd hear um, uh, sermons that I really agreed with. And then afterwards, Everybody went home and there was no, there was nothing happening. You know, they were talking a great line, but there was nothing happening afterward. Then I go to these Orthodox synagogues and in my experience, I'm not saying this is true of all Orthodox synagogues, in my experience, I heard racism, I heard, you know, terrible denunciation of, of uh, Palestinians and, of, uh, and a kind of sneering at non-Jews and so forth. Afterwards, I couldn't stand the sermons, but afterwards, people would come up to me and they would ask me if I had a place to go to lunch, for dinner, or do I, you know, do I have somebody in my family who's sick? Uh, would you like to meet a woman? You know, I mean, I mean, people were paying attention to like I was a real person with real needs, you know, and and not just um, uh, somebody who would have a good idea in his his head. So. Um, there's that reality for our movements. I think our movements, our organizations, um, wouldn't it be amazing if our, if our peace movements had a, a part of the time that they're together in which people were organized to connect with each other in that way. First of all, to organize it so that you met people you didn't come with and you didn't know. Secondly, that, you were in, that there was some structure built for making ongoing connection between people and not just ongoing connection about how to organize the next demonstration. 
but our connection about how do we care for you? What's going on in your life? How can I take, how can I show you some kindness and generosity? Wouldn't that be a better kind of movement to have where we were embodying this idea and not just talking about it? So thank you. Thank for you reading. so much. Thank you. Uh, you said earlier that it's a uh, big mistake to let realism shape your views. So I wanted to ask you a very unrealistic question about one of the pieces posted on your website, uh -oh. which was uh, titled Hamas's Electoral Victory, A Nuanced Response, in which you made the observation, we are one, in all caps, uh, should no longer be the slogan of the Jewish people alone, but of all people on the planet. And from that recognition, and policies that stem from that recognition, we will achieve peace and social justice for all. Our prayer is that the human race quickly comes to this recognition and a beautiful place to start would be for a transformation in the consciousness of both Palestinians and Israelis so that uh, both sides uh, could recognize the humanity of the other. Now, if uh, you believe in this principle and in, in these pieties that we are all one, then shouldn't we accept the unrealistic proposal that the best solution to the conflict in the Middle East would not be a two-state solution, but a one-state solution, one democratic, secular, multinational state for everyone, so that you could prove in real life that this is an unrealistic solution that can serve as an example for everyone, not a two-state solution, a one-state solution? Um. Well, I wasn't here to talk about Israel, okay? But um, since you raise it, <laughs> um, um, for the short run and what's achievable in the, short, in the very short run, I think a two-state solution is achievable. However, for the long run, okay, for the long run, which what I want is not a one-state solution, but a no-state solution. That is to say, I don't believe in nation states. I think that they are an outdated form. And so, <laughs> so just, as I'm, just as I said before about domestic politics, I'm not going to go for partial reforms in a world that needs much more dramatic reforms. So in regard to Israel-Palestine, I want to see the world reorganized. Now, you think that this is utopian, but I'm saying it's, it's, um, it's actually much more necessary than one state of Israel-Palestine. What is needed is to reorganize the, the political economic forms of governance in the world around ecological survival of the planet. Because the primary issue facing the, the 21st century is not whether Jews and, and Palestinians can live together. It's whether we can save the world from ecological destruction before, in the next 40 to 60 years, before we wipe out the possibility of human life here. So if you're talking about what am I going to go for in the next five years, I see no possibility of going for a, uh, a one-state solution in the next five years. If you're saying, what do you want really, then what I really want is not a one-state solution, but a no-state solution. So it's unrealistic to go after a one-state solution. You want a two-state solution, a realistic solution, in other words. There are, there are unrealistic state, uh, solutions that, that uh, we should go for, except that they also might be evil. So I don't know that the, the fact that... Uh, so anyway, I'm just... I'm weighing in. Yeah, I'm, no, 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 no. I'm, no, no. Yeah, yeah. De des destroying, destroying a state, destroying a culture, Destroying the one place on the Isn't planet where two. No, no, it isn't, sir. Yes, it is, sir. Okay, well, we'll talk another time. And that's very realistic. We'll, we'll talk afterwards. We'll talk afterwards. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm Susan Shepard, and I'm from First Parish here in Cambridge, actually. And I want to thank the other men who let you come That's up right. I was going to say we've had a, a form of affirmative action here. Thank you. Great. Um, and I wanted to thank you, first of all, for your statement about the religious right and gays and lesbians. Um, I think um, over the past couple of years since we got uh, gay marriage in Massachusetts that people have blamed us for every uh, left-wing disaster that has, you know, happened. Um, the votes against Kerry and so forth and so on. And I think it's, it's good that you realize, and it's good to hear it, that the right wing started this fight first by calling his victims. But, um, what I saw in the gay marriage thing here in Massachusetts, I want to know if you saw this in talking to other people, was that um, once it was about love, people loved it. And people in this state supported marriage, and I think they will, marriage equality, over the next few years. And do you think that would go in Kansas? 
Uh, yeah, I think mm -hmm. that love will go in Kansas. Um, in other words, I think that really, um, when we begin to articulate what we're about in terms of love, we will have a much better chance than we, when we articulate it only in, only in terms of rights. Mm -hmm. When we just begin to articulate a vision of love. But, um, I, I mean, I believe that the strategy that I'm talking about is the best strategy for protecting gays and lesbians in this society. Um, just as I believe it was the best it's the best strategy had it been used in the 1920s would have been the best strategy to um, to build a an alternative kind of movement to the fascism that emerged in the in Germany that is to say I don't believe that again I don't believe that that people are inherently evil or inherently homophobic. I think that there are things that have happened to people, ways in which they've learned to frame their experience that lead them in destructive ways. And I think that we have to move them in other ways. Then the question is, what's the most effective way to move them? And I'm trying to say we need to um, develop a, an articulation of our ideals. And it turns out that our ideals, when we articulate them at a deep enough level, transcend left-right categories and actually unite a lot of people. And from that space of union between a lot of people on both sides, it's possible to rethink gay, uh, gay and lesbian struggles in, in a way that makes people not feel so scared of them. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I mean, my strategy, uh, the, what, the left hand of God, the, the network of spiritual progressives were totally committed to not allowing gays and lesbians to be um, demeaned in this society. But that as part of, we don't want anybody to be demeaned any place on this planet. Say so one of the things that we're calling for is, is for people to come to understand that the well-being of each of us in this country depends on the well-being of everybody else on the planet and on the well-being of the planet itself. And that the well-being of each person in this country depends on the well-being of each other person in this country. That we are all intrinsically linked. So we're standing up articulating it and clearly on the side of, um, of uh, ending the demeaning of gays and lesbians and the denial of their rights. Okay, we'll take, we'll take two more questions. Um, yeah, because I'd like to sign some books. Thanks. Uh, I'd like to meet you, actually, yeah. talk to you. Yeah. yeah. Hi. First, Hi. First of all, um, one of the places where these issues are uh, given expression and to some extent fought out is uh, over the question uh, now perhaps somewhat hyped of evolution versus so-called intelligent design. Yeah. And I, the specific question I'd like to ask about that is, is science just another religious belief system? And because I'm picking up on something you said during your talk. Mm. Secondly, we don't have enough time to go into all the deficiencies of the Democratic Party. Uh, not tonight, but yeah. since you mentioned Kansas, I would be interested to hear if you have read, did you read Thomas Frank's yes. book, What's the Matter with Kansas? What's your take on his analysis? And I would like to add just one little brief uh, appendix to that, which is that there's a critique that's been done by a political science professor at Princeton named Bartles that's called What's the Matter with What's the Matter with Kansas, in, <laughs> in which he says it's not Kansas, it's the South. And um, mm -hmm. I, I can't do justice to Bartles' okay. arguments, but, but um, perhaps that would open up some elaboration on, the, on those issues. You know, you're raising really wonderful questions. I can't do it tonight. Yeah. I mean, it's just like the energy here. I, I've been on my feet for the last hour and a half. I don't think no. I can, can get into an on, honest, in-depth thing. I can promise you that in the book, the, the question of science and the distinction between science, which I'm totally for and want to protect from both the, the right religious right and from government and from corporations, each of whom play roles in distorting it. Um, I want to totally support science, but I want to distinguish science from scientism, which is the inappropriate um, application of the scientific method in areas where there's no particular reason to think it's, it applies. I have a chapter in my book about this. Okay. okay we're going to take one more question. Can I and stick one in? Well, couldn't I meet with people? I want to. I want. I want to meet with people. Okay, we'll take one more question. I mean, it's just like the energy is. Yeah. 
Go ahead. Uh, I, I certainly applaud everything that you've uh, said here tonight, and I've, I've read some of uh, what you've written. Uh, but one thing seems to be missing. Uh, the only you, one? Uh, well, perhaps, <laughs> perhaps more than one. Uh, you're a supporter of Israel, and Israel seems to be exactly the opposite of everything that you've said tonight. Israel is driven by a supremacist ideology, uh -huh. which is quite opposed to what you've uh, talked about here tonight. Uh, do you oppose that? Will you condemn Zionism? Will you advocate equal rights for Palestinians in Israel? I totally support equal rights for Palestinians in Israel. Um, I certainly will not condemn Zionism as uh, any more than I condemn socialism or communism for the distortions under Stalin. Do Zionism I condemn, do is I condemn Jewish wait, supremacy. Wait, um, you want to hear my answer, okay? So I don't condemn Zionism. I do condemn the ways in which Zionism got distorted by some, the right-wing leaders who have been its uh, major uh, representatives. I think that there are, I don't, I don't uh, condemn the United States, even, I mean, I don't denounce the United States or Americanism, even though I very much critique everything that the United States has done with regard to the way it's treated African Americans for the last 300 years. In other words, I'm against many of the things that have happened in Israel. I'm not against the Jewish people having the same rights of national self-determination as every other people on the planet. I want us to have the same rights as everyone else, including the right to be equally screwed up with everyone else. But that doesn't mean that I won't, won't challenge it, that I won't mm -hmm. critique it. I've been one of the major critics of I Israeli policy, as I'm sure you know. I've been an outspoken critic of Israeli policies, but I'm not critiquing the, the in impulse of the Jewish people to have a national self-determination and protection for itself. However, in that regard, as I already said, I'm in favor of transcending all those nationalisms which were appropriate for the 19th and 20th century and are increasingly the obstacle to ecological survival of the whole planet in the 21st century. So I am no more ready to condemn Zionism than I am con to condemn Englishism or, um, or Americanism or all the other national entities and national self-determinations. I think they each in their way have been perverted, each in their way has oppressed others, each in their way has, been, um, has uh, not embodied their own highest ideals. and. Um, so let me say this last thing, okay? Um, and this, this approach to Zionism or to Americanism or whatever flows from a deeper in, um, insight a bit that I talk about in the book, which is that our approach has to be one of compassion for the inadequacies of each of us. Because every one of our, mo our movements, I, I used to meet people in the, who in the 70s and 80s would tell me, I went into the movement and I was so disappointed because it turned out that people in the movement were uh, just as screwed up as everybody else. And to which my answer is, duh. <laughs> what in the world did you expect? I mean, there is nothing else on the planet. There is nothing else All's on the planet. All I wait, hear no, is equivocation. There is nothing else on the planet but screwed up human beings. And if we're gonna transform this world, we're gonna transform it with screwed up human beings, with limited human beings. And so the appropriate mes message is compassion for each other, not only pointing out our inadequacies. We need to transcend our inadequacies, but we do it in a loving way. Okay, thank you, Rabbi Michael Lerner.